Thank you so much. We now make our way um, to our next speaker, um, Dr. Nodia Malan, um, from who is, of course, the Izimbanda Zokutla founder and senior lecturer in the Department um, of Business Management. And um, he will be joining us to unpack the futuristic farming, changing what we eat and how it's grown. And of course, um, Dr. Nodia Malan is a dear old friend of Food from Zanzi. Thank you so much. Oops. Thank you, Duncan, and uh, thank you, Food from Zanzi. Uh, thank you also to all the people I know here. Um, there's a few familiar faces. But uh, before I start speaking, um, um, and also great respect to the minister who is not here anymore, just uh, to say to all the farmers, please realize that you are the one in this society that is feeding us. You are the leader of your people. We look up to you to feed us. And this presentation that I'm making is dedicated to all the farmers, struggling and non-struggling, new and old, who are feeding us. And it's my absolute honor to be here and to speak to you in this regard. Thank you so much uh, to Food Forms Anzi as well. So uh, as you know, I'm a, a, a senior lecturer in business management. I just have to have this slide here. Because I don't know, if I don't have this slide, I get fired. So uh, I'm so glad I'm going to still keep my job. <laughs> so, you know, I have to always be, have a bit of humor because, uh, you know, I, I talk to people for a living, so I know what I'm doing. I hope so. So um, can I just get to the next slide? Thank you. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what's happening with food. And uh, I have no uh, uh, nice videos and stuff, although I, you can believe me, I can really walk on my hands and I can show you. But but we need to understand the history of farming to actually understand what does the future hold. And there are some very bad things in history where, that we do need to acknowledge. And uh, I just have to also say, as a white person who have benefited from apartheid, uh, I do understand what it did, and I am deeply sorry about that. Um, it is something that I would like to hear a lot more, but I do understand that some of us are not as fortunate as others, and it is our duty to carry the burden of the world and make this world a better place. So the way we can do that is to actually understand why are we in this position that we are now. And it's very important to, to be clear about that. You know, um, in the pre-colonial time, we, um, we ate our indigenous uh, uh, vegetables and, and meat and all of that. Um, and it is important to understand that when we adopted agriculture about 20,000 years ago, that's when we stop being the Bushmen. That is a great moment in, in human history. That's when we started urbanizing as well. It doesn't make sense to farm if, you are, uh, if there's no city to farm for. So rural and urban life is very much tied up with each other. And, and we need to understand that it's, it's urbanization that sets farming in motion. So it's not really a rural activity. <laughs> you know, it's, it's an, uh, we're feeding urban people here. Um, but we also need to understand that the, what did colonialism do? And colonialism, we often forget, was actually, um, I mean, the Brits were typical and, and you know, God save the queen. Um, <laughs> you know, um, what they did is they, they liberalized their own market, um, and it's well documented, but what they said is all colonial markets are now controlled by the state. And that is what happened and what made it possible for Fribura to, to move into places like Africa and farm. And, but the first time they farmed, it was done for the colonial company. And that ended, um, um, or, or agriculture really was established by the state in a very, very decisive way. How's it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do this often. <laughs> um, so, um, sorry about the green there. So, so what happened is, um, that also came to an end, and um, it led into the, the period of um, mechanization, the Green Revolution, and the modernization of agriculture. And that explains many of the things that we've just heard about. Why do you need minimum of 400 hectares to be viable in, in maize? I mean, it's because of the economies of scale and the globalization of the agricultural uh, market. So in such a market, size matters. 
So, um, and this is not going down well with the 2.5 million communal farmers, the majority of our farmers in South Africa who have about five to 10 hectares or sometimes less. So they are immediately at a disadvantage, no matter what state can do. Because if you don't have the size, it's going to be really, really difficult. Um, and we need to acknowledge that, although, you know, um, me as an academic, I, I'm kind of paid to look at both sides of the coin. So we do need to acknowledge that, but you must be clear. Don't fool yourself. Um, if you're a small farmer, you are in competition with giants. So you have to be very smart to make it work. And that is why I uh, appreciate the reference to, ag to technology. And I want to end on that. You know, what is it about technology? Can technology and the way you farm change that equation which makes size important? Probably not, but let's see. There are things that are developing that you might need to be aware of that could change the structural conditions around your farm and it could make a smaller farm more viable. So I can't talk about all of that. Oh, goodness, where am I now? Okay. So no, no, we can go on. Thank you. <laughs> so what is happening in the world? We have to be clear. You know, China and Europe and America to some extent have exper are experiencing serious climate change. The next season, their import uh, requirements are going to be much more stringent. And we must expect the introduction of a substantial and substantive a requirement for sustainability around the food market. So we have to rise to that opportunity. And it is better for us. I'm not here, you know, I, I look at both sides of the coin, but I do think we need to understand that the ecological impact of farming, which is 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions, is something serious to consider. If you're a large farmer and you do not move into that direction, your, uh, the big markets are going to close so South Africa trades 25% with Europe, 20, uh, roughly 25% with the, the East, 25% with Africa, and 25% with America and the rest of the world. But we can't export uh, agricultural produce to America so much they, they block their markets. So South Africa's economy is diversified. But if China and Europe are demanding a sustainability built into the product, then we need to rise to that challenge. And we must expect that to come they are getting pretty hot out there. They're not used to it. <laughs> so you can imagine what the soccer hooligans are going to tell their ward councillor or the elected representatives. They want sustainable products. So we need to know about that. So what are the alternatives? So the first one would be to look at some kind of agroecological production system. And I'm not just saying this because the hippies or the left are saying this. Uh, I do understand there is a need to produce like we are producing at the moment. But there are uh, constraints to that. The fertilizer prices is just one of those things. But there are alternatives. And if you do not look at the ecology as an alternative, what you are missing is the 3% productivity uh, per year that the ecosystem can give you. And that 3% is perhaps what you need to be solvent. So I'm not saying chuck all the chemicals and mechanization away. Don't be stupid but also don't throw that away as well. So um, radical agroecological perspectives look at the ecosystem around the farm and that ecosystem could be productive for you as a farmer. Um, and we, we call it in a, I should look at this. The, the more fancy way to look at this is, is to look at syntropic agriculture, which is a property of systems where the systems, where the, the, the subsystems combine to build a better system. And that is how that is um, looked at. What we also need to be aware of is the rise of controlled environment agriculture. Sure, our, our meats and our grains will always be grown in the rural areas, often in rain-fed conditions. And it's important to acknowledge that and keep that going. But for the rest, especially our kitchen vegetables, which make up a large part of our food, those can be grown in controlled environment conditions. And that's important because... Um, you know, you can get a really good yield out of that, but be careful. Um, I work in urban agriculture and studies have shown that the high-tech greenhouses, with all the sensors and all of that, they don't actually perform as well as just a tunnel on the ground. And it's due to the capital costs of the high-tech stuff. So there's also a limit uh, to the benefit of 4IR. The cost could go beyond what you could recover 
especially if you're a smaller farmer. So in those cases, you've got to think very clearly, maybe move back to a tunnel that's in the soil, but prepare the soil in an agroecological and your best organic way, because um, that might be the way to do it. So you've got the, the benefit of the tunnel and the drip irrigation and that kind of monitoring, but you also have uh, the productivity of the ecosystem. And, and, and that might be the way to, to get ahead. So let's just not ignore that and think about that. Um, there's uh, hydroponics. Um, I saw Lance's here. You know, thank you, Lance. Um, aquaponics. I also want to just uh, talk about aeroponics and also insect farming. Um, you know, we had a, a master's student in development studies, knows nothing about agriculture. She uh, developed, Ayanda Boy, she developed an insect farming system. She wrote a book on it for a master's on how to farm crickets uh, for human consumption and for sale. And she did it in deep sluit in a squatter camp in a shack. So that can be done. So, you know, all hail to her. Also, we need to be aware that the end of agriculture is in sight. I'm sorry, guys. Um, uh, Technology is coming and it's running in bundles and there's a lot of things and people are starting to produce meat proteins in vats using carbon dioxide and hydrogen and energy. So we don't need meat anymore and it, it produces a powder like flour you can put it in your bread that signals the end of agriculture which is obviously a lie but we need to listen to these guys yeah the, in the kitchen vegetables a lot of things you can't really grow um, outside the soil but we need to know about these things so let's quickly talk about that next slide thank you so you know i just steal all this from the internet so this is the basics of the agroecological point of view and you can see there's all kinds of ways in which a farm is conceptualized. In an agroecological farm, you will have a mixed farm. You will not have a monoculture. And you will actually be building your farm so the interrelations between the plants and the animals guarantees your productivity. So permaculture is just not, not a hippie thing, but it's a very well worked out system of design, which makes a lot of common sense around things like getting your fields level so you plant the water the water doesn't flow off but it flows in all of those things you can do plant on the borders of your contours a, a large perennial crop and on the insides your your seasonal crops those kinds of things are going to make a big difference and what the design is going to do the design is going to perform the labor that you do so you don't see permaculture farmers walking like that because they've designed the farm so that the, the layout and the features and the infrastructure actually creates the productivity. I can't get into that. Um, we can just get to the next slide. Um, thank you. Uh, you missed the... Anyway, so the next slide talks about, and it's not a good slide, about syntropic agriculture. So what these guys do is they plant forests. And in the forest, you have your upper story, understory, middle story, and it is in these syntropic systems that, um, you know, they chop the branches of the trees off quite a lot, compost it quite a lot. But it is the mix of plants in such a system that leads to the productivity. So this is maybe not appropriate for a large scale grain farmer. But if you're a smaller scale farmer and you're growing kitchen vegetables, you could mix it with your agroforestry. Those kind of design considerations are productive. And you would be stupid not to look at it because they could give you uh, productivity just by design. And um, this will also be very conducive to, especially if you are farming for local markets, because you will have a diversity of crops. They'll give you resilience in your system, and, um, um, a, 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 and, and you can have a, a much better business model due to the fact that you're not buying inputs and your, your revenue, a greater part of your revenue is more profitable. So go, um, uh, you know, take a look even at a guy like James Blichnot from uh, UP. His work shows us that regenerative grain farmers, who are, um, you know, they, they often make more money per hectare than those who are depending on large input costs, uh, large inputs. And I just want to say to farmers, you must up us because you might be farmed by someone else while you are trying to farm. And I'm not being negative here, but be clear on what is going on in this market. It's a cutthroat capitalist market. So be 
be clear who is farming you. And when you buy a lot of inputs, you must be clear, are they going to give you the returns? Are there alternatives? So um, the James Blichnot examples show um, mixing, well, very uh, uh, meager examples, mixing cover crops with livestock in your grain system could have more benefit than if you are purely uh, plowing and planting. Um, so we spoke about the disking and, and the ripping, but a lot of people are not plowing, but using no-till practices and uh, conservation agriculture actually goes beyond that. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, and that's just so I also don't get fired, you know, so because I am an academic. So the next one is really about controlled environment agriculture. So here we see the introduction of high tech systems. And this could be quite um, uh, productive, especially if you are closer to your urban centers. I also just want to just mention just another fact that about 70% of all irrigated lands in the whole world are within 30 k's from urban centers. So most agriculture is already a kind of an urban agriculture. So we must understand that these things are tight. The urban and the farming systems are tightly integrated by transport and all these networks. So in that system, you would want to consider a controlled environment a production system or farm that is actually located almost inside the urban area. And in that place, there you can control all things from wind, humidity, temperature, light, um, uh, uh, you can look at pests, uh, uh, water content in the soil, etc. In that context, the 4IR high-tech technologies might pay off, and it might be a good idea. But if you, are, if you have extensive lands, it might be a better idea to just get tunnels. So it's a very important choice that you need to make, and don't be fooled by the technology. You as the farmer must make that decision, and you need to know what is your conditions, because every farm is different. So um, just keep that in mind. Thank you. Can I just move on? Uh, next one. So, I mean, this is just another picture. I just show pictures. You know, I can't really walk on my hands here, so I have to keep your attention in some way. But you can see the controlled environment agriculture very much promoted in the first world. The first world is extremely dependent upon uh, the third world for food. England uh, imports 60% of their food. Um, the Netherlands, everyone says it's the biggest exporter, but we forget the import and then the export, and much of it is flowers, so it's, it's, a, it's a false statistic. But the, the, the first world cannot produce its own, own food, especially Europe, um, also not China, so they need imports. And that is why they come here and they produce these uh, farmer development programs so that they can, sorry, farm with you so they can feed their own people. So you must understand this game, um, but you've got to play the game. You can't get out of it. Um, yeah. So, you know, you can see, th thank you. Yeah, let's just go on. You can see that in your controlled environment system, you're going to have to have quite a lot of high-tech stuff to make it work, to make it viable. Um, and then, of course, hydroponics. So this is a very basic picture, but the most simple hydroponic systems I've seen was people in Mdeni in Soweto, just plain and simple, taking black bags, going to the river, getting river sand, and then watering three times a day with a cup of the salts and, and water. That's a hydroponic system. You can go all the way. You can pay 10,000 rand a meter for a serious system. Who's farming whom here? Or you can make it your, your, yourself with, with uh, toilet pipes. And I've seen a lot of people do that and actually make good business in doing that. So consider this, but don't jump to the high-tech option. Consider the bottom stuff, you know, a black bag with river sand and three times watering a day could produce a crop if you have very little land, and it could produce an income. You know, my research on urban agriculture has shown very low incomes of around um, um, between four, 400 to 2,000 rand a month, but there's a small percentage of urban farmers who succeed in producing uh, and, and gaining income of about 20,000 rand a month, 5,000 rand a week. Now, that's not great. It's not big enough to pay for a John Deere tractor, but it is enough to create a livelihood, especially if you're in an urban area, and you can sell all that food without any middlemen. You can be a retailer. Um, so a lot of farmers here start a spaza shop on your farm immediately. 
Yeah. Because the people around you um, are paying, are buying your food that has tr gone from, from you to the fresh produce market, to some pack house, to another pack house, to a fridge for two weeks, and then to the shop. Doesn't make sense. So if we want this sector to grow, those are also the inefficiencies we need to eliminate. So I'm glad our Caritas is here with Kula app. Maybe that can help. Um, but think about it. So your hydroponic system could be low tech, very effective or high tech and also very effective, but you must make that choice. So let's, uh, let's go to the next one on the aeroponics. And this is just very simple. So this is really, really interesting. So these crops, uh, the, the roots are not even in water. They get sprayed by a mist sprayer. And there are guys there in Irene that make these systems. They manufacture them in Irene um, at the Railways Cafe, which is also a fabrication laboratory where they teach people how to make these things themselves. So an aquaponic system might be a really good idea if you don't have water because they use even less water than an, a hydroponic system. Um, I know this is an aeroponic system, my, my mistake. Um, so think about that. This could be quite a solution to some of you. And that nozzle doesn't have to be a fancy nozzle. You can get stuff from the uh, hardware store, but bear in mind that you are using the hydroponic salts in the water, so the nozzles could get clogged. So you've got to do your homework around that. But that's something that, that one could think about. Um, just carry on. Yeah. So and here's a very, very simple, this apparently from the internet is in Cape Town. It's basic. Look, it's wooden structures and plants growing and it's the water just simply drips from the bottom down to the, the bottom and then you could have fish at the, at the bottom. So this is a very important system because these aquaponics could get away with almost no input cost except your energy and, and your equipment. But your fertilization comes from the, uh, the fish manure. But this is something to think about and it doesn't have to be even as high tech as that. The, on the on YouTube uh, University of YouTube, which is a rival to UJ, uh, you see, <laughs> you know, the data costs make UJ much cheaper. <laughs> um, but what you could see is, you know, take a, a thousand liter water tank, chop the top, flip it over, and build a, a, a aquaponic system to learn how to work it. But these are kind of things that one could think about, and especially for people who are farming in backyards um, and and in the peri-urban areas. Think about these things, uh, you, know, uh, you know, read it up. It could, could make a difference for you. Really, really interesting to see that these op options are there. And, you know, check, all these things are inside the house. So, you know, no one's going to so much steal it and all that kind of thing. Okay, so let's move on. Um, that is an insect farm, big one. It's the biggest, biggest one I could find on, 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 on Google. Um, but insect farming is becoming an issue, you know, it's becoming an opportunity. The simplest is obviously with, um, with worms, um, you know, uh, your, your, your earthworms. And don't go buy the worms because the worms are already in the soil. You know, just put the food there for them and they will come and then you can get them. But I can't give you worms because the worms only live if they have food. So if I give you worms, it doesn't help. You have to actually have the food. So, you know, get your own worms and, and start a worm farm. Oops, there goes the load shedding. You know, start a worm farm um, and think about how that, um, you know, how that could create a, not only a high value product in the worms and the casings, but also a manure that you could use maybe, you know, depends how big a system you want to build and how big your farming is. But they will produce and they will deliver and they will deliver by processing wastes. And there's a lot of waste out there. Um, and that's something that we need to think about. Next one, please. So that is the typical black soldier fly farm. So the reason why this is interesting is not because the, uh, the, 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 the larvae eat the, the stuff and makes compost, but because the larvae has a specific pattern of behavior. When it is ready to mate, it wants to go upstairs. So that's why those white pipes are there. So while all its buddies are eating the, uh, the, the, the compost, the worm farms grow, uh, walk, the worms walk up and they jump. Uh, how many, is that two or three? Okay. Um, and they walk up the pipes and dunk in a, in a container and you can feed it to your, your chickens. The design of the worm farm eliminates labor. And that is what you need to understand. That's very important. Next slide. So here's your competition. Lab-grown meat, 
You know, I don't know how the stuff tastes, and it's actually, we, we need to actually look at the life cycle because they all eat seaweed, and I wonder how much it costs to, to harvest the seaweed. But this is your competition, um, and, I, and it's coming, um, and it's already on sale. Next slide. And um, you can see this is where they farm this meat. Yeah, sure. Hey, I wonder if you can make biltong with that stuff. So, you know, think about that. This is the future and it's coming um, and um, uh, we can go further. And what this indicates is uh, the pink one. So there's the guy who designed this, uh, the scientist. So, um, you know, this is the fermentation where they use carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas um, and, and add, add heat and that creates and the, uh, a yeast creates an animal protein. No more biltong. So we've got to be aware of this. It's coming. And maybe some of you would want to do that. So the next slide just gives you a picture of how it works. Um, and it can use renewable energy. And it's, it's quite important to think about that. We can just go to the last one. So what am I saying here? I have shown you technologies. And the one thing that we need to understand is that we, especially in agriculture, we are already completely surrounded by, by, by technology. Agriculture is not natural in that sense um, it could be organic but it is not the way in which nature produced and and all the farmers will will agree with me you got to actually cheat nature or fluke it so that you can start producing in numbers to sell and that is what agriculture is is a manipulation of of the natural world so we need to understand though that we are completely surrounded by technology so the choice of drawing a line in the sand and saying I'm not going past that is a false choice because you're already deep in a technological technoverse. So you have to jump in and swim right down to the deep end with technology in your farming. But what you must also understand is that technology is not just the machine. The technology always comes with the bundles of other technologies and stakeholders. So understand the processes that the minister is instituting to get you to adopt the technology. What she's doing is she's making you uh, available to you a bundle of stakeholders and you need to engage in that bundle of stakeholders. Some are going to be private, some are going to be public, some are going to be sharks, some are going to be civil society. But it's in engagement with them, with D John Deere, uh, with the Agricultural Research Council, with the IDC, with your fellow farmers, with the white farmer you've never spoken to, with the black farmer you've never spoken to. Go and enter that and participate as a stakeholder in a cluster of stakeholders. And it is in that context where the best results in adopting and implementing technology will be, will be realized. Thank you very, very much for listening to me. It's been great to be here.